is a lovely rectangle. And our rectangle represents the universe that we're in. And in this case, we're talking about shapes. So we're in the polygon universe. Okay. And inside the polygon universe, there's some galaxies. Okay. We have two of these galaxies that overlap. Galaxy one is quadrilaterals. Galaxy two is convex figures. Okay. So we have a bunch of quadrilaterals and we have a bunch of convex figures and some things are both. And that's where we get a rectangle. A rectangle is a quadrilateral. A rectangle is convex. A rectangle is a, sorry, quadrilateral. Can't spell quadrilateral and is convex, right? We have both. So that's P and Q. So if I say the rectangle is capital R, he lives here in the middle because he's both a quadrilateral and he's convex. So he lives in both galaxies. Anybody that's just in this part, these are just quadrilaterals, so these are non-convex, so concave quadrilaterals. And everybody that lives over here are convex figures, but they're not rectangles. So hexagons, pentagons, any, basically anything that's not a quadrilateral. That lives outside of the circles is a polygon but that's not convex and is not a quadrilateral. So like out here, we might have a star, right? Because a star is a polygon, but it's not a quadrilateral and it's not convex. In here, we could have a Something like this, right? We have it's a quadrilateral, but it's not convex. And in here we could have pentagons and all kinds of other shapes. They're just not quadrilaterals. But this zone in the middle is if quadrilaterals is P and convex is Q, this zone in the middle is P and Q. Again, we'll stay in the polygon universe. And I'll have my quadrilateral area and my convex area. So quadrilaterals are P, convex is Q. Hold on, I'm going to make my circles a little better. I want them a little more overlappy. Okay. So I have my quadrilaterals. I have my convex figures. The center is still going to be P and Q. What we have over here, these are all of the things that are P, but they're not Q. And here we have all the things that are Q, but they're not P. And if I say P or Q, that gives me this section, or this section. 
So these, this would be the red circled parts. But again, you could be both, right? So you're also Q. So P or Q could be any one of these three zones. P and Q is only the center. So if you're just a quadrilateral, you're over here. If you're just convex and not a quadrilateral, you're over here. If you're both, you're in the middle. And if you're a P or Q, so you're a quadrilateral or you're convex, you could be anywhere in those circles. or one or the other or both, right? We talked about spaghetti and meatballs or spaghetti or pot rolls. You could be spaghetti. You could have spaghetti. You could have pot rolls. You could have both. It's an or. You could be anywhere. Where you're not, though, is outside of the circle. Because you're here, here, or here. You're in the circles because you're either a convex or you're a quadrilateral or you're both. So you don't exist out here in the rest of the square. Okay. We can use Venn diagrams to answer questions. Um, what we have is the universe of the Spanish club meeting. We have people that can attend in May. That's everybody in this um, Everybody in the blue circle can attend in May. Everybody in the red circle can attend in June. Okay. So to answer these questions, how many people can attend the May or June meeting? Remember to live here, you have to be an and. If you're an or, you can be any one of these. So I'm going to do 5 plus 6 plus 14. Okay, there's 6 that can go to both. 5 that can only go to May. 14 that can only go to June. And 6 that could be both. So if you say or, you've got all of these people. So I have to add them all together. So I get 25. Now if I ask how many people can attend the May and the June, that's 6 because you're in the part where the blue and the red overlap because you can do both. Okay. And if I just um, ask you can't attend either meeting, 2, right, because they're not in the circle, they're outside of our galaxies. And then if I just said June, I've got everybody in the red. Yeah, so I have 14 plus 6. And if I just say May, 5 plus 6. Okay, so we can even have three overlaps, right? And let's say that this circle is people that play baseball. And this circle is people that play basketball. And this circle is people that play football. So up here, this would be basketball only. Okay, this would be, ba uh, sorry, baseball only. Getting my sports. So what happens when you have somebody that doesn't play sports talking about sports? So that's baseball only. This is basketball only. And this is football only. These people in here do baseball and basketball. These people here do base and football. And here, these people do basketball and football. And then these people do all three. So you can have 
more than just the one overlap. You could have three overlap where you have categories like this. And then, I mean, that happens in the real world, right? You have people that play more than one sport, or you have people that only play one sport. And so you can organize this by numbers. Like we talked about, you know, uh, people in a high school district that will participate in sports, and you can see how many did one sport versus how many did two sports, or how many people will be in all three. And then if you asked a question like how many people play basketball or baseball, you'd have everybody in this circle basketball and everybody in that circle. Because it's an or. So they'd be in either this circle or that circle. So you'd have all of these zones. Basically the only thing that you'd leave out are the people that play football only. Does that make sense? You, you leave the football people and just the football only people, yeah. Because if I said basketball or baseball, it includes everybody in the big basketball circle, and it includes everybody in the big baseball circle, and the only thing that gets left out from those two circles are the football only okay. people. They don't play basketball or baseball. You know, we ask questions like that and get numbers that way. That's what spin diagrams are nice for. Absolutely. So the universe here is prom attendance for graduates last year. Um, I should put graduates up there. All right, so we have people that went to their junior prom, people that went to their senior prom. How many... Uh, Graduates attended their senior, but not their junior. 25. Yeah, 25, because we're in the senior only section over here. Um, attended junior and senior. So uh, we used and, so it has to just be the overlap. So and, so this part right here is and, and then this part right here is or. Oh, when or. Yeah, when it's or, it's all three. When it's and, it's just the middle. Okay. Um, didn't attend either prom? And how many students graduated last year? Well, this is the universe of graduates, right? So it's everybody. in that whole universe. So 270 people graduated last year. Because we take all of the ones that did go to proms and all of the ones that didn't. <coughs> okay, conditional statements are kind of what they sound like. They are statements that give you a condition, something that has to happen. Um, they are written in the form of if then, most commonly. So if something, then something else. Those are the most basic ones. So like, as an example, here's one I have often used. If you clean your room, then you can play video games. Okay. The condition is you have to clean your room. Okay, there's my, I mean my son. He has to clean his room if he cleans his room. So the condition is you have to clean your room. Then you can have the, con the conclusion to playing the video games. So it's a conditional statement. One has to happen for the other to happen. So the if-then statement is written as if. P, then Q, okay? So we get that if P, then Q, where P is one statement and Q is another. The symbols for that is P and then an arrow Q. 
And what that means is P implies Q. So the implication is, is that if P happens, then Q will happen. That's why there's an arrow. Like P happens, so it leads to Q. So you can read it as P implies Q or if P then Q. Okay. The hypothesis of the statement is the if part. Okay, or the P. This is the condition. So in my example, the hypothesis is you clean your room. The conclusion is the then part, or the Q. And this is the result. And in my example, the conclusion is you can play video games. Okay, so the if part is the hypothesis, but it's also the condition. And then the then part is the conclusion, which is the result. In conclusion, first you look for the hypothesis, which is after the if. So if the forecast is rain, then I will take an umbrella. The if is the hypothesis. Does that also if work, work like work problems? Um, like not terribly, not really. Yeah. So the hypothesis is the forecast is rain. The conclusion is I will take an umbrella. That's the part that comes after the then. Yeah, sometimes they're backwards, though. Um, what happens in this case, a number is divisible by 10 if its last digit is 0. We're still going to look for if, and if is the hypothesis. So here's our hypothesis. And if we were to write that as a if then, it would be if a number's last digit is 0. It's the part that comes after the if. And then the conclusion is what's left over. Is divisible by 10. Okay, so we just, it's flipped, right? So all we did was. The number is divisible by 10 if its last digit is 0. The if is still the condition. The last digit has to be 0 for it to be divisible by 10. So if still identifies the hypothesis, and then what's left is the conclusion. We just don't have a then in this particular sentence. So. We want to look for if first. Okay, um, if a polygon has six sides, so here's our hypothesis. Then it is a hexagon is our conclusion. And then we have another performance will be scheduled if the first one is sold out. So the first one is sold out is our hypothesis. which makes another performance will be scheduled, our conclusion. And again, we could rearrange that. If the first performance is sold out, then another one will be scheduled. We can write a conditional statement, and the words if and then are nowhere to be found. But it's still a conditional statement if there's a condition that must be met. So. Points will be deducted from any paper turned in after Wednesday's deadline. The condition to have points deducted is if the paper is turned in after Wednesday. This is our condition. So if the paper is turned in after Wednesday's deadline. 
So we can rewrite it as an if then. No. So here's our condition, which makes that our hypothesis. If the paper is turned in after Wednesday's deadline, then points will be deducted. Okay, so you look for the thing that will cause the other to happen. Whatever it is that's going to cause the other one to happen, that can be your hypothesis or your if, and then the rest of it's your conclusion. So if you wouldn't say if points will be deducted, then you'll turn the paper in after Wednesday, right? That wouldn't make sense. It's just it, if you turn the paper in after Wednesday, that the points would be deducted. Sometimes it's not always necessarily very clear as to which one is the condition. A mammal is a warm-blooded animal. Okay, that's true. Yes, we agree. That's true. Okay. If I were to say if an animal is warm-blooded, then it is a mammal. Is this necessarily true? No, because no, it could be a bird. If you have a true sentence and you're trying to turn it into an if-then, and then you write one, if an animal is warm-blooded, then it is a mammal, and then you get something that's not true necessarily, this isn't the way we want to go. So we flip it. If an animal is a mammal, then it is warm-blooded. And this is true. So sometimes, like I said, sometimes it's not really clear which one is the condition. But if you write it out and it's if you if this first sentence is for sure true, which it is, and then you write out an if then that isn't necessarily true, because you can find a counterexample, flip them. If you write it with if they or if them. No, not really. But I mean, you guys can see like how one is for sure true and one is iffy. I mean, it is true that warm-blooded animals are mammals, but not every warm-blooded animal is a mammal because birds are warm-blooded and um, there are warm-blooded fish. Um, you know other things. Reptiles don't count, but they get a bad rap. Let's look at this one. A prism with bases that are regular polygons is a regular prism. Which one do you think is the condition? Yeah, for it to be a regular prism. The condition is that it has to have regular polygon bases. So that part is the if. So if we rewrite it, we could say if a prism has bases that are regular polygons, then it is a regular prism. Sometimes the order doesn't matter. Four quarters can be exchanged for a dollar bill. I could write if you have, you has an, uh, a, uh, can't spell today. If you have four quarters, then you can exchange 
or a one dollar bill but I could just as easily keep if you have a one dollar bill then you can exchange for four quarters and it would be the same truth right so sometimes the order doesn't really matter your condition could be that you have four quarters and you need a dollar or your condition could be that you have a dollar and you need four quarters because they're interchangeable so in a sentence like this they both be true so you could write it however you want it value of conditionals so if you take and you look at a conditional oops sorry back here um, actually let's change let's not look at this example let's look at the example I gave you for my son so I say if you clean your room then you can play video games okay so we'll use that example how do we know if this is true or not okay so we have our hypothesis and we have our conclusion and then we have our conditional okay the hypothesis is that you clean your room the conclusion is you play video games. The conditional is if clean room, then games. Okay. If you clean your room and then you're allowed to play video games, so like my son, he cleans his room and then I say, okay, here, yes, you can play video games so they're both true then the conditional is true the room is clean games are played okay but let's say he cleans his room but then I don't let him play games Essentially, I lied to him, right? I, I told him, if you clean your room, you can play your video games, and then he cleans his room, and I go, never mind, no, you can't. This makes the conditional statement false because the condition was met, but his conclusion didn't happen. So he met his condition of cleaning the room, but then I took away the video games anyway, couldn't play them, so then I made it, it was a false statement that I made. I, I lie. It's a lie at that point. Okay. Now, what happens if he doesn't clean his room? Hmm? I did true, false, true, false. Oh, this, I'm going to put a thing between here. Okay, if he doesn't clean his room and I don't let him play video games, or if he doesn't clean his room and I do let him play video games. The truth values on these, it's kind of obscure. Um, the conditional said he had to clean his room. So, if the condition, if the hypothesis is false, the conditional is always true. So in both of these situations, whether I let him play video games or not, because this was false, it makes the whole statement true. Because if he doesn't play, if he doesn't clean his room and I don't let him play video games, it was a true statement. Right? Because I said you have to clean your room to play video games. If he doesn't clean his room and I still let him play video games, it's still kind of a true statement. I'm just kind of a... Because if you clean his room 
Maybe. Yeah, I mean, it's just, once this is false, the whole statement becomes true. It doesn't really matter anymore what happens here. Does that kind of make sense? So the only way you get a false conditional is if the hypothesis was true, but the conclusion didn't happen. That's the only way the conditional is ever false, is if the hypothesis is true, but the conclusion doesn't is false. If the hypothesis is false, it doesn't matter about the conclusion. It just makes it true. And if they're both true, then it's true. So if we look at that um, in a more just, oops, use the correct pen. So if we talk about the conditional, okay, if we have P and Q, the conditional is P implies Q, true and true gives me true, false and true gives me, or sorry, I meant to say true and false. True and false gives me false. And once this is false, it doesn't really matter what these are. They're true. So false implies true. We don't even care about these. And again, the only way a conditional is false is if the if is true and the then is false. Like if I told you, if you turn in all your homework, you'll get 100% homework average. And you turn in every homework assignment and I give you like a 70 or something. I'd be lying, right? It would make it a false conditional. I would never do that. Don't look at me like that. But I, it would be a lie. That becomes a lie. An integer. Okay. Hypothesis and conclusion, but is it true? No, it's false because what if I do 3 divided by 5? It's not an integer. Okay. Um, if next month is August, then this month is July. Well, yeah, it's true, right? So you get true and true. If a triangle has four sides, well, a triangle does not have, sorry, let me. A triangle does not have four sides, so this makes our hypothesis is false. So the whole statement is true. Because once the hypothesis is false, it doesn't matter anymore. And then if an angle is an acute angle, then the measure is 35 degrees. False, because it could be... 40 degrees or any other number that's less than 90, right? Okay.